Arizona reported 522 deaths from heat. That's up 84 percent from the year before. And in 2020, the city of Phoenix had 53 days that year that got as hot as 110 degrees. Experts say that Arizona's daytime and nighttime temperatures have both been rising even more now. Climate change is a factor, but so is Phoenix's population growth and development. The city boomed back in the 50s. Reason being, air conditioning. As the population grew, so did concrete infrastructure. That reduced green spaces in town considerably. Now, states like Arizona are taking steps to insulate their cities against high heat. But what will it take to keep Phoenix cool enough to be livable? Joining us now is Peter Kalmus, a climate scientist at UCLA's Joint Center for Regional Earth System Science and Engineering. He's also the author of Being the Change, Live Well and Spark a Climate Revolution. Mr. Kalmus, welcome to the program. Thank you. So what do you see in terms of the ways that cities like Phoenix deal with this extreme heat? It seems like some of the heat issues are foreseeable and manageable. You look at a city like Palm Springs, California, it has incredibly intense heat, and they have found ways to live with that and work around it. Are there solutions that are applicable to cities like Phoenix? Well, there's two major factors that are increasing the heat in cities like Phoenix. So one, of course, is global heating, which is caused primarily by burning fossil fuels. And the second one is something called the urban heat island effect, which comes about from having lots of black surfaces, rooftops, pavement, and fewer green spaces in cities like trees, which help keep things cooler. So um, you know, you can deal with some of the stuff from the urban heat island effect. You can mitigate some of that dark pavement. You can install what are called cool roofs, which are lighter color and reflect more of the sunlight. And you can plant more trees. You can also have better access to things like cooling center centers, make sure that people have air conditioning. But um, that'll only take you so far when you have uh, you know, fossil fuels being burnt worldwide, which are making the planet heat up continuously at about uh, a, a couple of fractions, uh, two, about 0.2 tenths of a Fahrenheit every five years, just getting hotter and hotter every year. So um, you know, ultimately, we're going to have to deal with climate breakdown and global heating, which is caused by this heat trapping CO2 being emitted into the atmosphere and changing the heat balance of the planet. And frankly, the only way to do that is going to be to end the fossil fuel industry, and we are all going to have to face that as a society very soon. Could you put into context something for me that you just said in terms of this heat increase, two-tenths of a degree per year? How big is per, that? Like, it, it, How close does that put us to the point where we reach, for lack of a, of a finer term, a point of no return? Like, How much does two-tenths of a degree per year actually factor? So that's per every five years. So um, you know, years, usually sorry. we talk about degrees Celsius when we're talking about average global heating. We are right now on track to surpass 1.5 degrees Celsius of global heating in the early 2030s. Um, and then you know, further on, we're going to surpass two degrees unless we take very rapid action currently. And you can, you can get a very rough sense of what that translates into in terms of Fahrenheit by multiplying by a factor of two. So in the 2030s, we're going to be about three degrees Fahrenheit hotter uh, in the global average. Now over land, it's even more. It's, it's roughly another factor of two. So then you're looking at you know, maybe roughly another five degrees Fahrenheit from compared to a planet where we didn't have global heating uh, in the 2030s. And when you add that on to heat waves that are already hot in places like Phoenix, you'll start to see in the 2030s, for example, heat waves that used to be uh, like a once in 50 year event. So really, really bad heat waves will start to, becoming, uh, start to becoming approximately once every five years. So that's the, the current projection. And what's really, Our, um, the thing that really keeps me up at night is that that's not as bad as it can get, right? So there's basically no ceiling. The more fossil fuels we burn, the worse this will get. Are there certain places, certain urban areas where, you know, I think one of the things that some folks have suggested with some parts of the country, whether it's heat, whether it's flooding, your parts of the Gulf Coast that tend to flood every year. One thing some people have suggested is maybe you shouldn't move there. Like maybe we should depopulate some of these areas. I do not know how feasible that is in Phoenix, and I do not want those angry emails. So please do not at me on Twitter for saying you should leave Phoenix. But 
Is that something we need to consider in terms of where people are in addition to the sources of the emissions that we're putting out? To some extent, but I would counter that by pointing out that one of the really surprising things that happened last summer in the Northern Hemisphere was what we called the heat dome event up in uh, the Pacific Northwest, Northwest, so Seattle and Vancouver. That was a, just a sort of a shockingly intense heat wave at fairly far northern cities, right, all the way up in Canada. So um, in a way, I think one of the things that we have to learn as a species from that heat dome event, and, and again, remember, uh, these, these very, very hot events, the, you know, 2021, the very, very hot summer, that's more or less the cool, coolest summer that we'll all experience for the rest of our lives. That's just the nature of, you know, things getting hotter every year. This is not a new normal, right? We're kind of on an escalator towards higher heat. And I think what the heat dome event taught me, at least, is that there's kind of no place to run, right? We're all in this together on the planet. There's certainly some places which are gonna get hurt, uh, that are gonna get hit earlier and harder. Unfortunately, a lot of places in the global south, close to the equator, um, if we don't take very rapid action as a species, some of those places close to the equator uh, will soon, later this century, but, but very soon, within decades, uh, start to become too hot and humid for the human body. And so people won't even be able to live there. So, um, you know, in my opinion, uh, this is an emergency. Um, I know there's a lot of other stuff going on right now. You know, we we're just talking yeah. about collapsing bridges. We're in the middle of a pandemic. But this is kind of a slow rolling emergency that will keep getting worse every year. And we have an industry, the fossil fuel industry, that has literally been lying to us and misinforming the public for decades since, uh, you know, the, well, in the early 90s. They got together and, and kind of collaborated and discussed how they could prevent action, right? So we, as I think as a society, we need to get start getting angry about that and discussing how we're going to rapidly uh, transition away from fossil fuels. Well, with regard to that, I, I hear you in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, I hear you in terms of transitioning away from fossil fuels. I think that will happen as, you know, more vehicles come online that are not fossil fuel dependent. I'm, I believe that there are people who are willing to do that if it was a vehicle that would kind of meet the need without having to pump gas, especially as the cost of gas goes up. In the meantime, before I have to let you go, are there any cities that are doing it right, as you see it, that are making steps in the right direction that others might emulate before I got to let you go? Oh, wow, that's a great question. I know there's a lot of great uh, legislation going on in, uh, in New York City and in New York State. Uh, State of California is really starting to step up. They're, they're realizing that this is something they're going to have to start actually spending some money on, and hopefully they can become a sort of a beacon to the world. Um, but again, this is, I really think this is something that has to happen at the federal level. And since it's a global problem, eventually we're somehow, I mean, we're not very good at this as, as humans, unfortunately, but we're going to have to learn how to do this uh, in a coordinated way on the international level as well. Yeah, that is definitely not something we've been good at so far, but <laughs> time will tell. We'll see. We might just get our act together one of these days. Peter Kalmus, a climate scientist at UCLA. I appreciate you making time, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.